Welcome to the Autologous Stem Cell Transplant Education Session. This presentation will help you, your family, and friends understand what an autologous stem cell transplant is and what's involved in the transplant process. Here are the topics we'll explore in more detail during this session. The autologous stem cell transplant process. The healthcare team who will be with you before, during, and after the transplant. The preparations for your stem cell transplant. Collecting your stem cells. High dose chemotherapy. Your stem cell transplant. What happens after your transplant and how to best manage your side effects. First, let's go over the autologous stem cell transplant and how it works. Autologous stem cell transplants are used to treat diseases that affect the bone marrow, blood, or immune system. The process uses your own blood stem cells to replace cells damaged after high-dose chemotherapy for your disease. You might hear autologous stem cell transplant referred to as a rescue treatment. Hematopoietic, or blood stem cells, live in the bone marrow, the soft, spongy part in the middle of your bones. They're capable of self-renewing and can develop into blood cells your body needs, including red blood cells, which carry oxygen throughout the body, white blood cells, which form the immune system and help to fight infections, and platelets, which help form clots to prevent bleeding. Normally, there are very few stem cells found in the bloodstream. Stem cell transplant is a journey. There are four main steps in autologous stem cell transplant. Step one, you have your own stem cells collected. Step two, your stem cells are taken to transfusion medicine for cryopreservation. Step three, you'll be admitted to hospital for high dose chemotherapy treatment. This conditioning treatment is expected to eliminate or reduce the remaining disease, but it also kills the regular cells in the bone marrow. Therefore, stem cells must be collected prior to this high-dose chemotherapy. And lastly, step four. Your frozen stem cells are then thawed and returned to you through a central line the day after chemotherapy is completed. The stem cells make their way to the bone marrow to set up and start producing normal blood cells again. This is called rescuing the bone marrow. Everyone's transplant journey is different. Your pre-transplant workup will take about two to four weeks. Your stem cell collection will take about one to three weeks. You'll be an outpatient during this time. You'll be admitted to the hospital about two weeks after your stem cell collection. Your hospital stay will be about four weeks. Our experienced, dedicated, and compassionate team of healthcare professionals are ready to support you every step of the way. Once you are referred to the transplant program, a hematologist will be assigned to you. A hematologist is a transplant doctor who specializes in diagnosing and treating conditions that arise in the blood and blood-forming tissues, including bone marrow. There are six physicians that care for autologous stem cell transplant patients. Dr. Elmery, Dr. Sabri, Dr. Bosch, Dr. Rebecca McKay, Dr. Stacku, and Dr. Kodad. You will meet one of these doctors at your consult. During your time in hospital, you will have different doctors caring for you, including clinical associates. They may change depending on their schedules, but all the doctors work together to provide the best care for you. Once you're discharged, your assigned transplant doctor will take over your outpatient care. Our transplant coordinators will help prepare you for your transplant. They'll arrange tests and procedures that are required prior to transplant. They teach you and your family what you need to know about stem cell transplant and possible side effects and complications. They'll coordinate the timing of your transplant corresponding with the collection of your stem cells. The registered nurses in the clinic are responsible for nursing assessments post-transplant, organizing your care after the transplant, and will be your main point of contact if you have any new symptoms or concerns.
Our apheresis or stem cell collection nurses will collect your stem cells in the Oncology Day Center. These dedicated team members provide support to patients and their loved ones during and after treatment. They provide counseling and support, resources, assistance with practical matters, and facilitate family meetings. Our inpatient and outpatient pharmacists help teach you about chemotherapy and other medications you'll take during your stem cell transplant. Once discharged, you'll be provided with a medication schedule and they'll teach you how to manage your medications at home. Pharmacists work closely with your doctor to decide which medications may help you the best. The team on Unit 6100 is made up of many people who will care for you during your hospital stay. Our clinical associate physicians will provide day-to-day -day care. Nurses, pharmacists, dietitians, transfusion medicine lab staff, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, and many others will help with your care. You are an integral part of the team, and you have a vital role to play in your care and recovery. As you know yourself best, we depend on you to report how you are feeling and how the treatment and other factors are affecting you. Your family or caregiver will also play a vital role in this. Preparing for your stem cell transplant. What you can expect leading up to your procedure. We will cover your consultation, the treatment location, debulking chemotherapy, and workup tests. Once you begin debulking chemotherapy, you'll have a stem cell transplant consult with our transplant team. You'll meet with a transplant physician, transplant coordinator, and social worker to talk about how the transplant will benefit you, how long the time commitment could be, the tests and procedures needed before the transplant, financial costs as well as medicine and drug coverage, the expected risks, complications, and possible side effects, what other options are available if you choose not to have it. Your transplant coordinator is always available to answer any questions. Moving forward with this transplant is your decision. Rely on the information provided to you during your transplant meeting and conversations with your healthcare team. Stem cell transplant is a lengthy process. It starts with debulking chemotherapy, pre-transplant assessments, stem cell collection, admission to hospital for conditioning chemotherapy, stem cell infusion, engraftment and recovery, and ends with you getting your life back to a new normal. Many patients will have already been receiving debulking chemotherapy to help lessen the disease. Patients must also respond to this chemotherapy before transplant. It's often given as outpatient. The treatment varies dependent on the disease. When you decide to proceed with a stem cell transplant, we'll begin planning your schedule of tests and procedures. A number of tests are needed to ensure you are ready for stem cell collection and transplant. This will be a very busy time for you, as you'll have many appointments. Two main areas need to be assessed, your cancer disease status and your overall health. You will need to have a physical exam, disease re-evaluation tests such as a CT or PET scan, or myeloma blood work blood work to screen for any viral infections and also assess kidney and liver function, a pulmonary function breathing test, an echocardiogram or heart ultrasound. A dental appointment is required. You'll need a cleaning and clearance from the dentist before we can proceed. Also talk to your transplant coordinator or doctor before you have dental extractions or root canals done. If you're on Zomita or Pemidromate, which is most myeloma patients, this appointment must be done within four months of transplant. Have a fertility discussion. If fertility is a concern to you, please talk to your transplant team. A referral can be made for you to see a fertility specialist to talk about your options for fertility preservation. Before your stem cell transplant, there are many steps to complete to get yourself ready. Some of those preparations include physical, emotional, legal, and financial considerations. 
While you're completing your treatments and undergoing pre-transplant assessments, there are a few things you need to think about. Exercise. Many people keep up with their regular exercise program or start a new one in preparation for their transplant. This is dependent on your present activity level and physical condition. Exercise is a positive way to channel stress and promote general well-being. Generally, the more conditioned you are, the better you will be able to physically manage transplant and recovery. Nutrition. Eating healthy and meeting basic nutritional pre- and post-transplant needs is important. A referral to our outpatient dietitian can be arranged for nutritional concerns. Hair loss. Unfortunately, you'll lose your hair during this process. You may want to shave your head ahead of time, purchase a wig, or have a favorite hat or scarf with you. Smoking cessation. If you smoke, vape, or use tobacco products, you're strongly encouraged to quit smoking prior to being admitted to hospital for stem cell transplant. This will help you have a better chance of successful treatment, fewer serious side effects, a faster recovery from treatment, a lower risk of infection, easier breathing, more energy, and better quality of life. Once admitted to the ward, your blood cell counts will decrease and you'll be unable to leave the ward to smoke. Ask a member of your healthcare team if you need help with quitting smoking. There are a number of supports available. Following stem cell transplant, we recommend not smoking and avoiding secondhand smoke as both can increase your risk for infection, lung complications, or a second malignancy. This process can be overwhelming at times. You're dealing with a lot battling a disease, considering an entirely new lengthy and complex treatment plan, which does come with some side effects and risks. There's a lot of new information and medical jargon to wrap your head around before you decide if this treatment plan is right for you. So understandably, you may be feeling a lot of emotions, including fear, frustration, anticipation, and also hope. Your transplant journey ahead is full on uncertainties. The process is different for everyone, and the unknowns can be difficult to cope with. Your social worker is available for counseling sessions and can recommend other resources for emotional support. Legal, getting your affairs in order. It's a good idea to have a healthcare directive filled out so your family and transplant team can carry out your wishes if you cannot speak for yourself. The healthcare directive discusses your wishes regarding medical treatment. It can also name a proxy or decision maker. If you need help making one, you can use the My Voice booklet from the Saskatchewan Cancer Agency. A current will is also important to have regardless of health status. It's a legal document expressing your wishes. If you have questions, you can talk with your social worker or lawyer or visit www.plea.org for more legal information. Financial Considerations and Assistance It's important to review your financial resources and needs. You'll be required to take a leave from work for at least three months post-stem cell transplant. The exact time period is different for everyone depending on the type of work you do and how you're feeling. Contact your employer to find out what you have available for sick leave, short-term and long-term disability. Contact the Government of Canada regarding accessing CPP or EI medical benefits. If you need financial help, ask your social worker. They can help with accessing other sources such as Kinsman funding. Here are some of the other costs you may have to cover throughout your stem cell transplant journey. You'll be responsible for costs associated with parking. You may want to consider buying a parking pass for Royal University Hospital. Parking is $18 a day. Weekly and monthly passes are available. Internet connection is free. Once you're admitted to the hospital, you can ask a nurse to help you get connected to Wi-Fi. Medications. You'll receive a number of different medications when you're discharged. Some coverage options to help with medication costs include third-party drug coverage such as Blue Cross, Special Support Program, and Seniors Drug Coverage, 
All transplant patients will receive a special support application in the mail prior to transplant. Everyone is encouraged to fill out this application as it can lower the cost of your prescription medications. Travel and accommodations. You'll be required to stay in Saskatoon for a few days at certain times during the stem cell collection process. Talk to your social worker if you need help finding a place to stay or need help with funding for these costs. You'll need to stay in the Saskatoon area at certain times during your stem cell collection, possibly for two to five days. Some options for accommodations include the Saskatoon Cancer Patient Lodge, hotels, motels, and rental suites. You can ask your social worker for an accommodations guide for more places to stay. Once your preparations are complete, we can begin the next phase of collecting your stem cells. The process of stem cell collection includes three main steps. The mobilization phase, which is when we move the stem cells from the bone marrow to the bloodstream. Your central line or equistream is inserted. Collecting your stem cells. This can also be called the apheresis phase. The mobilizing phase uses drugs to help stem cells that normally live in the bone marrow move out of the bone marrow and into the bloodstream so we can collect them. To help move the stem cells into your bloodstream, you may get just GCSF injections alone, which is short for granulocyte colony stimulating factor, also known as grastophil or filgrastum. It's a man-made protein which stimulates the growth of neutrophils. It's an injection given just below the skin. Or, mobilizing chemotherapy depends on your disease. This chemotherapy will take one to three days and is given to you as an outpatient in Regina or Saskatoon. The most common side effects are nausea or vomiting, diarrhea, sore mouth, mucositis, hair loss, low blood counts, and fever. Your transplant coordinator will give you more information about this. Patients are taught by a nurse to give their GCSF injections at home. Here's an example of a stem cell collection schedule for a patient that's only receiving GCSF. Here's an example of a collection schedule for a patient that's receiving both GCSF as well as chemotherapy. Here's an overview of your schedule for the stem cell collection week. On Monday, you'll come to the Saskatoon Cancer Center. You'll have blood work done in the morning to count the number of stem cells in the blood. We'll bring you to meet the apheresis nurse so you know more about what to expect for Tuesday. A central line called an equistream will be inserted on Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning. On Tuesday, you'll check into admitting at the Royal University Hospital and proceed to the Oncology Day Center where the stem cell collection is done. Your stem cell collection will start in the morning if your stem cell count is high enough. If the GCSF injections with or without chemotherapy aren't successful, there are other options that can be considered. Before we can collect your stem cells, we need to make sure you have enough of them in your blood to collect. To find out how many you have, we do blood tests that tell us your stem cell count. It's called a CD34 count. Once there's enough stem cells in your blood, we can start to collect them. You will need an equistream line inserted for a stem cell collection and transplant. It's a long, flexible tube inserted under the skin of your chest with the help of an ultrasound machine. You'll be given local freezing for this procedure. After the insertion, you'll be required to recover for a couple of hours. You'll need to have someone drive you after the procedure. It's often referred to as your central line. Your equistream line will be used to infuse your stem cells, draw blood tests, receive chemotherapy, IV fluids, medications, and blood transfusions. That's the benefit of the central line. You'll not have to be poked constantly for blood samples, and you can get medications and chemotherapy using the line instead of starting an intravenous line. This tunneled central catheter will be in place for about six weeks. It's removed on the last day of your hospital stay after your transplant. Caring for your central line. 
The insertion site will feel tender for a short time. The line needs to be kept dry, so clear dressing will be placed on top. The dressing needs to be changed by a nurse at least once a week. At this time, the nurse will also flush out the lumens. Your nurse will also teach you how to care for your line to help prevent infection. You'll need to cover your central line site before having a shower or bath. To collect the stem cells, we use a process called apheresis. Apheresis means withdraw or to take away. Your blood, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, stem cells, go into a special machine. The machine spins the blood and separates the parts of your blood into layers. The stem cells are transferred to a collection bag. The remaining blood is returned to you. For multiple myeloma patients, we often collect enough for two transplants. The procedure is not painful. You may have some side effects. The most common side effect is hypocalcemia, a drop in calcium, which can produce tingling, chills, and cramps. We can help you manage side effects. The apheresis nurse will stay with you during the collection. So if you have any questions or concerns, just ask. They'll be happy to help. What can you expect during your stem cell collection? It may take one to four days and up to six hours each day to collect the necessary amount of stem cells. Collection will usually start at 8 a.m. and go until 2 p.m. each day until the collection is finished. You'll be sitting in a recliner chair with your central line connected via IV tubing to the machine. You'll be able to use your arms so you can do things like read, knit, or use electronic devices to help pass the time. Since you'll be there for several hours, you may want to wear comfortable clothing. You can bring in food and snacks and eat throughout the day. A lunch tray will be provided. You will not be able to go to the washroom during your stem cell collection, so you'll have to use a portable toilet chair or urinal bottle. One visitor is welcome to come with you. It's also important to note that someone will need to drive you because you may feel fatigued. How do we preserve your stem cells? After your stem cells are collected, they're frozen in our blood bank until your transplant date. This process is called cryopreservation. The lab staff add a preservative called DMSO to protect the cells until they're ready for use. Your stem cells can be stored for many years. After your stem cell collection, here are a few important things you should know. Make sure to drink plenty of fluids after your collection. You may also need to rest a little more than usual for one to two days after the procedure. The side effects are usually minimal, but you may feel weaker or lightheaded. This should only last one to two days. What happens next? Once your cells are collected, you'll usually have a break for about two weeks. You should feel well during your break but notify your coordinator if you notice any changes or illnesses such as cold and flu symptoms. It's important for you to go into the transplant healthy. You'll need some blood work done and care of your central line by home care. We'll give you a schedule for appointment dates and times. Your coordinator will let you know what date your admission for transplant is planned for. Your transplant will take place at Royal University Hospital on Unit 6100. Welcome to Royal University Hospital, Unit 6100. About two weeks after your stem cell collection, you'll be admitted to 6100. You'll stay there for about four weeks. This time includes conditioning chemotherapy, stem cell infusion, and recovery. If you have any problems, you may be in the hospital longer. You may be admitted to a public room at the start to ensure a bed, but you will be moved to a private room shortly after and for sure by the time your blood counts drop. Let's go over some commonly asked questions about your hospital stay. You may be wondering, can I have visitors? Yes, visitors are allowed on Unit 6100. Review the visiting hour policy upon admission and please note that no fresh or dried flowers are allowed on this unit. All visitors must be healthy, wash their hands when entering the unit, and wear a medical grade mask. 
sleep chairs may be available in certain situations. There are no shower facilities available for visitors to use. You may want to bring a few things from home with you to the hospital. We recommend that you consider bringing fun activities and games that will help pass the time, such as books, crafts, puzzles, crosswords, etc. A laptop, computer, or phone, including chargers. Your own clothes or pajamas if you choose. Also note that no laundry facilities are available at Royal University Hospital. Comfortable walking shoes. Toiletries are provided, but you may want to bring your own soap and shampoo, soft toilet paper and Kleenex, toothbrush and toothpaste, photos to decorate your room and hang on your whiteboard. You may also want to bring in shelf-stable snacks to be kept in your room. There is a fridge staff can store your labeled snacks. Family members may bring in meals for you as well. We recommend that you refer to the dietitian handout about what types of foods to stay away from while your immune system is low. You also need to follow the proper safety precautions for preparing food for patients with compromised immune systems. High-dose chemotherapy and your stem cell transplant. Let's go over everything you need to know about the process. Now that you've been admitted to hospital, you'll start the conditioning chemotherapy the next day. High-dose chemotherapy treatments help destroy cancer cells. Your regimen will be specific to you and depend on your disease. Most lymphoma patients will receive chemotherapy over seven days. Most multiple myeloma patients are given chemotherapy over one day. There are some other protocols as well. Talk to your transplant team about what type of chemotherapy you will be getting. Day zero is transplant day. The days before day zero, the conditioning phase, are negative days, day negative seven or day negative one. The days after day zero are positive days, day plus one or day plus 10. After your conditioning chemotherapy, you'll get your stem cells back the next day. Your official transplant day is often called day zero. The new stem cells help restore or rescue your bone marrow function from the effects of high-dose chemotherapy. Getting your stem cells back is almost like having a blood transfusion. Stem cells are removed from cryopreservation and will arrive in your room still frozen. They're thawed in warm water at your bedside right before they're given through your central line. You'll receive pre-medications prior to the infusion. The stem cell infusion will take one to two hours. Your vital signs will be monitored throughout the procedure. Once your stem cells are transplanted into your body, they enter your bloodstream and move to the bone marrow. Here, they start making new blood cells. It may take two to three weeks for new blood cells to be produced and for your blood counts to begin recovering. When they do, this is called engraftment. While you're waiting for engraftment, you will have very few cells to protect you from infection or bleeding. But as your blood counts begin to rise, that means the stem cells are starting to create normal blood cells again. It's important to remember that even when your blood counts are at normal levels, you're still at a higher risk of infection. This will last for up to 12 months after transplant. The preservative DMSO gives off a smell that some people compare to creamed corn. Your visitors may notice this smell a short time into your stem cell infusion, and it may last for a day or so. While you might not notice the smell, you may have an odd taste in your mouth. Sucking on hard candies may help get rid of it. You'll also receive orange slices on your tray to eat during the stem cell infusion to help with the taste. After your stem cell infusion, you'll be closely monitored. About one week after starting chemotherapy, you'll begin to feel tired and unwell from the side effects of the chemotherapy. Fatigue is common, especially while your blood counts are very low. A fever is often the first sign of infection. Almost everyone will get an infection in hospital and require IV antibiotics. You'll experience hair loss. 
The treatment damages cells that grow quickly, and hair is made up of fast-growing cells. You'll probably begin to lose your hair between 14 and 21 days after starting treatment. Digestive problems can occur because tissues in the mouth, stomach, and intestines are sensitive to chemotherapy drugs given before transplant. Mucositis is when the mucous membranes become irritated and swollen. This can lead to painful sores, bleeding, and infection. Good mouth care can help prevent infection and promote healing. You may need medications to help control diarrhea, nausea, and vomiting. Organ damage to your kidneys or liver, for example, can happen. This is usually reversible. Most of these problems are worse when the blood counts are very low. This is usually about one to three weeks after the transplant. Both during and after your transplant, you'll be closely monitored for infections and low blood counts. The nurse will draw your blood every morning at around 6 a.m. You'll be given blood and platelet transfusions as required. Most patients require IV antibiotics. You'll get a daily weight check, and a nurse will be monitoring your intake and output. As part of your daily routine at the hospital, you'll need to shower daily to maintain good hygiene and lower the risk of an infection. Wash your hands frequently and use hand sanitizer. Wear a mask when you leave your room and when you leave and return to the hospital. Follow proper mouth care, which will include rinsing your mouth frequently with club soda or prescribed mouthwash to prevent mouth sores or infection. It's also important to exercise and stay active to maintain strength as it can aid in recovery times and lead to earlier discharge. A physiotherapist can provide exercises. And be sure to eat and drink, even small amounts throughout the day. The treatment may affect your appetite and ability to digest food. You may experience nausea, changes in taste and smell, and difficulty swallowing. You can do your part to reduce your risk of infection by following a few basic practices. Practice good hygiene. Wash your hands regularly, before meals, before meds, after using the bathroom. Have your visitors entering your room isogel or wash their hands. Masks are also required. Encourage visitors not to come to the hospital if they're not feeling well. What can you expect after your discharge from the hospital? About four weeks after your transplant, you'll be ready for discharge when your blood counts have recovered and are not transfusion dependent. There's no active infection requiring IV antibiotics, or you're able to run antibiotics at home. You're taking all your medications orally. You're eating and drinking an acceptable amount. You're mobile and have the strength to complete regular daily activities. Your energy level will not yet be back to normal. What else can you expect after being discharged from hospital? Your Equistream line will be removed on the day of discharge from hospital. Appointment frequency is based on health concerns, but generally happens one month after discharge, unless there are concerns. You'll have blood work done once weekly upon discharge until your first appointment. This will be done at your local lab. You'll be discharged back to your original hematologist after three months, if that doctor is not your transplant physician. Some patients may receive maintenance therapy post-transplant starting three months after transplant. If you have a diagnosis of multiple myeloma, Hodgkin's lymphoma, or mantle cell lymphoma, Ask your doctor more about these therapies. You'll receive some medications when you're discharged, including an antiviral, valaciclovir, an antibiotic, septra, antinauseants, others as needed. What can you expect in terms of sexual activity after discharge? You may notice changes in your desire and sexuality after your transplant. Men may have lower testosterone levels after chemotherapy and a lower sex drive. Women may experience hot flashes, vaginal dryness, or less interest in having sex. Generally, sexual activity after your hospital stay 
is considered safe to participate in unless your platelets are low, which puts you at risk of bleeding. Your neutrophils are low, which makes it easier to get an infection. Life after discharge. What does your life look like now? For many people, it takes at least three months to recover from a stem cell transplant. Others may need more or less time. Recovery depends on many factors, such as overall health status, age, medical complications, prior level of activity, individual variation. For some patients, recovery time is relatively short. For others, the recovery period is slow, and some will never feel the same as they did before transplant. You'll need to remain off work or from school for three to six months. You may feel a bit lost once you're discharged from hospital. Some people feel down or anxious as they go through the change from staying in the hospital to leaving the hospital. These feelings are normal. After transplant, some people expect to feel as well as they did before they got sick. This is not always possible, especially right away. You will still need help from your family after the transplant. Family members might not understand how long it takes to recover, which may cause some relationship struggles. There are many things you can do to keep your environment clean and keep yourself as healthy as possible during your recovery. We recommend that you have your house clean prior to coming home. Change the air filters in your furnace once a month. Keep your environment clean. Stay away from molds and dust. Plants and soil contain bacteria, molds, and fungi, so they should be avoided. Avoid new construction, sawdust, and environmental chemicals, such as glue or paint. Keep your hands and body clean. Frequent hand washing and daily bathing. Family pets can stay in the home, but someone else needs to clean up after them. Avoid crowds by visiting public places during less popular and busy times. Protect yourself from the sun. Stop smoking and avoid secondhand smoke. Do not wade or swim in pools, hot tubs, ponds, or lakes. Some of the delayed or long-term risks include infections. Your immune system isn't normal right after leaving the hospital, even though your blood counts have returned to normal. Sterility is likely post-transplant. Fertility preservation should be considered prior to transplant if you're interested in having children post-transplant. Prolonged fatigue. Relapse of your disease. Routine scans and blood work are done post-transplant to monitor for this. Secondary malignancies such as leukemia, skin cancer are possible. Be sun smart. After your transplant, you'll need to be re-immunized for all of your vaccinations. You'll receive letters in the mail when you're eligible to schedule those vaccinations. Here's your approximate timeline. By four months, you'll need your COVID and influenza vaccinations. By six months, you'll need your pneumonia vaccinations. At one year, you'll need killed vaccinations such as hepatitis B. At two years, You'll need live vaccines such as mumps, measles, and rubella. You can usually return to work three to six months after your transplant. This varies based on how you're feeling and your work environment. It may help to begin slowly. As for traveling, we recommend that you talk to your transplant team if planning to travel within the first few months of your transplant. Camping, hunting, and fishing are discouraged during the early post-transplant period. It's important to prioritize your health and wellness. Make sure to continue regular activity and exercise. It may be helpful to follow a regular exercise program. Fatigue is very real. Give yourself time to rest. Fatigue tends to last for some time after transplant, so increase activity over time as your energy levels increase. Recovery depends upon a lot of factors. But the one thing that every patient should do is prioritize self-care. You can reduce stress and feel more calm and relaxed by listening to meditations or music, watching a funny show, practicing deep breathing, seeking out local support groups, 
focusing on your spirituality, and doing your favorite activities or pastimes that make you happy, such as games, puzzles, art, etc. Make sure to take your recovery one day at a time. Be gentle with yourself and others. Allow yourself to feel and express all of your different emotions. Make your needs known to yourself and the people around you. Talk to, lean on, and get help from your family, friends, and caregivers. These links include more information on advocacy, peer support, support groups, online chats, and other resources. Do you have any questions or concerns? Go to sascancer.ca for more information and resources. You can also reach out to your transplant coordinators, Tamara and Stephanie, anytime, and they'll be happy to help answer any questions you may have.